dum de dum de dum waiting for the camera to get rolling. And get plenty of rolling, and it's plenty rolling now. Ham Radio now from Orlando, from the Hamcation, Sunday morning early. We're live at the Orlando <laughs> Hamcation. Well, we're live now, but by the time the viewers say it, it won't be. <laughs> yeah. Ray Novak, we're at the ICOM booth, and Ray Novak has let us loose with the uh, brand new ICOM 7100. We're going to take a look at as much as we can figure out about it in a couple of minutes. It, it's the hot new radio, and everybody's been looking at it. But I, I don't think too many people have uh, really shown in depth the, uh, the touch screen, the responsiveness, some of the menu depth. Uh, I have not learned how to operate this radio. I haven't been through the manual. Ray showed me a few things about it. It is, um, well, tell you what, let's reset the cameras, and uh, we'll get good close-ups of it, and we'll show you as much as we can figure out on this in about 10 or 15 minutes. Okay. In, in true ham fest fashion, <laughs> we'll be poking buttons and twisting knobs with no direction. <laughs> That's right. And <laughs> it's, it's quiet right now. It's about 15 minutes before ham, uh, ham fest opening on Sunday morning. Sunday morning, the crowds are not going to pour in and, uh, uh, and raise our noise level instantaneously. Yeah. But uh, We still better get on with it, though, because people will want to see. Are you saying we should get moving and stop yammering yeah <laughs> they're gonna want to see the radio and we got it blocked up pretty good here <laughs> let's show you the radio so I have uh, not properly irised the camera so that you can see the screen because the first thing I want to show you is the actual body of the radio which is behind it um, and it is you know let's tilt that camera up just a little bit Jeff back over behind the camera so we can actually see this it's locked locked on the other side locked on yeah, there's your Here. tilt lock. Yeah, there you go. All right, there's the body of the radio. Um, it's 7,706 size. It looks like it might be just a little bit longer. On the back, let's go do a close-up of the back. Here's the back. Um, way more than I understand what's on it. Two antenna connectors. You know, one's going to be VHF, one's going to be VHF. You want your microphone back? I'm not sure which microphone is yours and which is mine. <laughs> Two data connections. Yep. Uh, there's a USB. Uh, that would be the microphone. Looks like Ethernet, but I'm pretty sure it's the microphone. It is. Uh, it is. And speaker and stuff like that. Or wait a minute. Oh, that's the Key. connection to the uh, front panel. And, um, so the, kind of the usual amount of stuff that you're used to seeing on the back of a radio these days. Okay, so don't worry about not being able to see the screen because I've got the iris of the camera open enough to see the stuff around it. It's okay. all in black. Um, the usual array of uh, knobs and buttons, um, maybe a couple more than you might see on a 706 or a 7000. Um, but uh, in, a, in a radio this complex, obviously all the buttons take you to uh, menus and you know, multiple capabilities behind almost every one. I was kind of curious about how this is going to be mounted in a vehicle, and because uh, it doesn't look uh, like the typical yeah, flat no plate to put a control panel, but um, there is uh, the usual mounting capability from the bottom, and as Ray was uh, discussing, um, you could put it on a ram mount, uh, you could put it I turned the monitor so I couldn't <laughs> see myself. You can put it on a ram mount. Uh, you can put it on a cup holder mount. There's a, variety, a gooseneck. It would have to be one of the uh, the uh, stiffer, tougher goosenecks. Yeah, that's just a tripod mount, right? Yeah. Like a camera top tripod? Yeah, I think it's probably the same threads. I'm not sure. Um, it's a little heavy for the lightweight goosenecks, but you can uh, get goosenecks that uh, can probably handle it. Um, so without actually putting it in a car, and I need President Obama to get rid of this fly, uh, <laughs> without putting it in a car and, uh, and playing with it, it's a little hard to tell. It would be great for somebody operating in a, a cramped apartment style location right. where they've got you know, limited desk space. Uh, sitting here on a, on a desk with the radio out of the way, that would be ideal. So let's uh, zoom in now and iris properly for the display and see some of the uh, the, the responsiveness and, uh, and and what things look like on the display, how things work. And again, we haven't learned how to use this radio, so uh, <laughs> we'll just be kind of flying flying blind and a little bit in the dark. 
Okay. So what was Ray showing us? My, my memory well, is real uh, for, first, let's take a look at the frequency display here and how you switch frequencies. Okay. It's just, um, it, it looks pretty typical, like any other HF rig, but your higher rate is to just touch the, the kilohertz. There we go. And it switches at this rate. Okay. Uh, now, off the camera, you're dialing just the big knob. Riley Hollingsworth's one big knob. <laughs> the big knob, like, that's right. Like every radio he was right. talking and about. And the big knob has a couple of tricks to it, too, that, yeah. uh, that we'll get to in a little bit here. Over here in the, uh, in the hertz range, if you don't like one hertz increments, you can just hold it, and it switches to 10 hertz rate. I thought so, you were left-handed. Oh, sorry. Okay, that's better. That's why I'm on this side, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, but the band switch, I thought was well, actually, pretty Actually, that was working pretty well because you were yeah. keeping your fat the finger out of, the, out of the way. My finger's not that fat. It's my middle that's fat. Here's the band switch. You just um, uh, touch the, the megahertz over here, and it brings up another screen where you can see the, the HF bands and uh, 6 meters, 2 meters, 440. And as we can see, the radio is set <clears throat> for 160 through uh, 70 centimeters without 220, of course. Um, I haven't seen how to get to 60 meters because you don't see uh, uh, 60 on here. We sure don't. We sure uh, don't. But that's probably might, set might have in, to actually have the manual for yeah, that. It might be set in <laughs> memories. Okay, and I think, uh, let's see, what are we? We're tuning in 10 hertz increments. I'm going to turn the 1 hertz back on just by holding that and set it on kilohertz here. Now, one thing that I wanted to see, and which you're sort of demonstrating, but you might describe, is the responsiveness of the touch screen. Is it doing what you want right away, or do you have to kind of push and hold and, and let's, finagle? Let's just take a look. If, if you just touch it, you can see it, it, it quickly it changes. It's, it's much more responsive than, than you would expect. Um, but if you do touch and hold, that usually activates different functions, or it, at least in some areas it activates different functions. So, so there will be times when you want to do that. But a light touch, touch screens that just need a light touch are really a joy to work, and that's, yeah. that's the case here. You could see maybe a problem uh, in, a, in a moving, bouncing vehicle when, when you can't. You probably have to hold your hand uh, to support yourself on one side of the, yeah. the control yeah. head. And, and one and thing then, that we haven't looked at yet is what happens if you're trying to do that and you hit the wrong part of the screen, how hard is it to recover? You know, if it's like getting off the wrong exit in uh, Boston, for instance, <laughs> it'd be yes. bad news. Yeah. But if it's easy to get back where you were and just hit the right one, that would be a good thing, but we just don't know yet. Yeah, and I don't think we're going to be able to figure that out. Well, we may, we'll see if we maybe get ourselves deeply lost here someplace. Okay. All right. All right, so what else have we got? Well, one thing I noticed that's particularly useful is uh, the soft keys at the bottom constantly change and depend on what you're doing, but the menu button here always returns it. <laughs> well, I was about to say always returns it to the same thing, but it doesn't. There's well, a lot of menus. What there. I've noticed is this has ICOM's um, inherent software development. They, they, as they've gone from one radio to another, they sort of keep the same base of functions. We obviously have to add to it and, and, and to sometimes um, modify a little bit because the radio is going to operate differently. But if you know how to program one ICOM radio, you have a big head start on programming another one mm -hmm. because there's going to be a lot of similarities. And this, like the 706 and 7000, has um, the uh, three menus within the M menu, and um, and now I'm trying to figure out how to get to the other menus, and I can't figure out how to do it. There, so. it's it's switching oh. as you push. Well, oh, you mean no, the, the sub menu? Yeah, there's an ah. S menu and a uh, um, some other kind of. <laughs> touch, touch I operate the S a 7,000 constantly, <laughs> but my fingers know what to do, and my my brain and my mouth have no idea what to do anymore. Touch the S meter. Let's see what's happening, and then we'll get back to something we know how it's going to behave. Well, it underlined it. Now it changed. Okay, so we're changing some functions in the oh, S yeah. ALC. Oh, ALC, right, right. Yeah. Compression. Compression. Power output. SWR. Nice. Okay. Let's see. Let's touch. Do we no get anything touching? Functionality on the S meter yeah. itself. Yeah, okay. those aren't doing anything. Right. Touching the memory button doesn't do anything. Okay. okay. Oh, there's receive incremental tuning. Not sure how you turn it on and off. That's actually a, oh, a yeah. hard okay, coded button, a button over here. Right. Um, let's look at the mode switch. We know how that works. Okay, sure, go ahead. <laughs> you just, right up here is the current mode, and if you just touch that, brings up a little, uh, little touch menu there of uh, what mode you want to go to. CW, for instance. Um, 
DV. Yeah, it, it operates D-Star Digital Voice uh, everywhere, HF and um, uh, VHF, UHF. And um, as we discussed, Digital Voice, uh, D-Star Digital Voice on HF is something to, to be aware of the bandwidth that they're using, 6.25 kilohertz. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you want to think about how busy the band is. It's probably right. not something we want spreading across all of our HF bands, but it's an interesting way to play digital voice right. initially until something else comes along that's more spectrum efficient but still does the same job. Mm -hmm. And can you guess what the uh, mode display is trying to tell us now? It's trying to tell us that uh, you're confused and you don't know what you <laughs> want to operate. Right. Okay. Okay, let's move on. Let's move on to something we do know about. How about filters? Yeah. If we, uh, we can switch filters just by, just by touching like so, one, two, three, one, and we don't know whether these are just programmable filters or if they're actually drop-in modules. Do you know? Um, I believe, no, I believe that they are programmable. programmable. I think this is, this is DSP. This I would is, expect so because uh, DSP. Uh, if you, you can set the width of the filter, if you just touch and hold the filter, it brings up a display here and you use the main Whoops, set, uh, there's a bandwidth soft key here, and if I click the bandwidth soft key, there we go, then you can, uh, you can tweak the bandwidth right. with the so VFO interestingly, now. Interestingly, we noticed that as you were attempting to push the bandwidth soft key, you had to go for it a couple of times. Yeah. And, and probably you just weren't, weren't spot on where it needed to be. But that could be. That's something to be aware of. The yep. size of the buttons for a small display that is touch screen becomes an issue. You've got to decide, well, how much real estate can I afford for how many things I want to put on the screen? And this looks like a pretty good compromise um, in terms of the size. It, for some people, it may be a little bit small. Some people may wish that they had stuffed more on the screen than, than what's there. Mm -hmm. But there's probably, it's probably a, a pretty good compromise, and, right. and you know, individual tastes may vary your mileage, et cetera, et cetera. And one thing I noticed while you were explaining that is uh, if I switch to a particular filter... You're paying any attention to me? The, the viewers were. I'm playing with the radio. <laughs> okay. So, which is more intro... No, never mind. <laughs> what I did notice was if you select a filter and set the width of that particular filter and move on to other filters, when you come back, that one will be where you left it. I set one very narrow like that. Two as broad as it could go, and three is wherever it was, somewhere in the middle. Yeah. So uh, apparently, pretty easy to program the filters. All right. What else do we see here? There's something that I noticed um, early on, and if I can find it. So this this well, is one of those scope. this is one of those things where how do you get back to something you saw before, uh, until you become a real expert in the radio? There's a, a, a button on the panel marked set. And at some point, I also found a soft button marked set, which was kind of unusual to see two buttons marked the same thing. And they took you to different places. But now I don't know how to get back to the one that was called set. What did you want to see? Hmm? What did you want to see? Just to show that there were two buttons, oh, one okay. hard button marked set and <laughs> one soft key right. marked set. OK, well, and, band and scope. Um, well, people are always interested in band scopes. OK, let's take a look. What was in the can next you, menu? Can you find it? Oh, OK. Well, maybe it was in the menu after the next one. There it is. <laughs> scope. Okay, and it's the sweep scope. Ah, the soft keys seem to be, the touch seems to be a little bit lower than you would expect, which I guess depending on how you mount it, because we both have mishit the soft keys a couple of times yeah. and a lower push. Could be parallax well, error. Yeah, yeah. Peter is opening the ham fest. <laughs> okay. I hope you have had All right. a good day yesterday. Okay, let's carry on. This could take a while, but yeah, so we'll, we'll okay, do the so best we can. Okay, so it's a sweep scope like we're used to. There's probably a way to set the bandwidth of it. Step. I just don't know what it is. Ah. Well, that's the step. Yeah, and, and the number of steps will set what the, uh, how broad what the width it is. Yeah. Yeah, how broad it is, I imagine. I never used the, the, uh, the scope on my 7000. I haven't found it all that useful. Little pips are a little bit too small to be particularly useful for me. Mm -hmm. uh, on my 756 Pro 3, I use the band scope all the time. It's, it's a continuously active band scope. It's easy to see what's up and down from me. You have an issue with band scopes, but only during well, contests like I Field Day and, an and new operators. I have an issue with band scopes with new operators, and especially at Field Day, and I think they need to be turned off or covered <laughs> up because I have seen so many new operators bypass lots of workable signals to get to the one they can see that may not even be workable for yeah. various reasons, pile up or what have you. That's irrelevant to the current topic, but I thought 
you, give oh, you a okay. chance to pontificate a little bit. <laughs> oh, I love to pontificate. What else can we get here? I know there's a SWR. Well, that's an interesting uh, soft key at the far left over there. What does it do? Oh, a single sweep, it looks like. Okay. No, of course, there's no signals here to see. Oh, apparently it's not dynamic when you use that. The, before the uh, triangle, I believe, was, was the one that was illuminated. Oh, cool. Yeah. I'm so how do we... So which means it may have been continuously sweeping, but now it's not. Yeah. But we're, I don't know. We're speculating. We'll have to look at the we're doing We're doing what hams do, speculating randomly on the basis of not nearly enough information. But we're allowed to do that because not released yet. Yeah, and we're pundits. Pundits, okay. Pundits. <laughs> Pontificating pundits. Pontificating pundits. What else? Nattering nabobs of negative. You know who said that? Nattering nabobs of negativism? No. Spiro Agnew. Oh, did he? Yeah, oh, back in gosh. 1969. I was on the radio on WDOR, Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, and we were broadcasting his, his talk. Yeah. And uh, he, he said that. I also got in trouble because I was a brand new disc jockey, and I, he went past the half hour. At that point, radio stations had to identify every half hour. And nobody told me that if you were in some sort of continuous material, you didn't have to do that. So he was in the middle of his talking, and the half hour came up, and I was starting to panic. I was the only one there. It was in the evening. And I, I potted him down a little bit, and I went, WDOR FM, Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin. Brought him back up. The next day, the chief engineer came, what did you do? Well, well of course, he was a very, <laughs> very tried and true red-blooded conservative. He yeah. was canine DKW. And you were operating with the usual amount of training. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He said, you don't interrupt a, a vice presidential address <laughs> to give a station identification. I'm going, hamana, hamana, hamana. <laughs> Before he was vice president, he was the governor of the state I lived in. Oh, cool. <laughs> and, and I heard that radio station you worked at in Sturgeon Bay. I had duty up there last winter and uh, tuned it in. Yeah, the still, Allen family is still, still looking after still it. Still on yeah. it. Hi, guys. <laughs> Props to Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin. Yeah. Start of my broadcasting career. Start an almost end of my broadcasting career. <laughs> All right, back to Would the have radio. Been a short one. Uh, let's see, I see a speed pitch button here, which uh, most likely refers to the, Baseball. the internal key or speed, speed per pitch. <laughs> uh, there's a YouTube video of a bird that got hit by a pitch one time. Very interesting. <laughs> that was a speed pitch. So uh, I would imagine uh, the speed most likely has to do with the key or speed of the internal uh, iambic key or and pitch. Might be the uh, side tone. The side tone, yeah. Yep. Um, All right, so uh, let's see. I pushed the set button, the right. hard set button, and that gets us to a... Oh, there was a receive log. Look at that. Oh. Receive no idea what this history. stuff is going to do for us. Um, well, that's an that's a on or off function there. So evidently, Ray showed us earlier that there was a, you could see the, a log in there of stations you had worked. I don't know if, it gets, if you stuff it manually or if it gets done in the DV mode or what. You haven't read the manual yet? Interesting. <laughs> RTFM, boy. <laughs> manual. <laughs> yeah, I know a lot of hams, but I only know one that reads the manuals, and that's not me. <laughs> Sometimes he has to review radios. <laughs> Okay, so interesting stuff there inside set. Quick. Push the quick hard oh, key. Oh, meter type. It might go to an analog looking meter instead of a bar meter. Oh, no, it's, uh, oh, it's okay. just the, uh, you know, what the meter's going to show the same. Get is, uh, same thing you get from touching it. Yep. Okay. And um, I don't know. We, we may have uh, gotten about as far as we can get with this. There are tons of other features within the software and the menus and the operation of the radio, but uh, our, our time is limited on showing it to you right now. The things I wanted to get to were the depth you can see and the responsiveness of the touch panel. Yeah, I, I really like the touch scrim. Not too sure about the soft keys here now. Yeah, see, they, they work just fine if you hit them a little bit low, so yeah. I think you're right about the parallax issue, maybe. And we're looking a little bit high on it because uh, yeah. we're standing right over it, so maybe that's, maybe that's some of the issue. All right, I still never did manage to get to the two steps, and I never found the extra menu, so I haven't figured out how to get there. Well, let's, let's do this. Let, let's Push every do button this we can see find. what happens. <laughs> <laughs> That's same, same set stuff you had before. Transmit bandwidth. Oh, there's some equal bandwidth. there's equalization and uh, in, within the transmitter, mm -hmm. so you can set 
what you sound like. The 7,000. said the audio band passes the transmit. That's interesting. We don't see that on many radios. Yeah. Yeah, and here and here you can adjust the the low, mid, and high. I believe. Can you set the bandwidth of the telegraph key? Um, that's, uh, I believe that has totally related to speed. Am I correct? <laughs> you well, you are correct. Yeah, faster you send, the more bandwidth you use. So exactly high right. speed CW guys, you're wasting space. <laughs> well, of course, there's there's the amount of spectrum used versus the amount of time. It becomes a time and spectrum issue. A time spectrum relationship? Yes, because you may be using a little more space, but you may be using it for, for far less time. less time. And I don't know how to calculate the, to the ultimate value of information transmitted for bandwidth use. We, we would have to use the IRS's model of a time space relationship for a business in your house or Sounds something. Sounds like Star Trek to me the time space continuum. <laughs> All right, what else can okay. we find? Um, what's the voice soft key do? See, they, they work fine when you hit them a little low on the button. Okay, it looks like it needs a... Oh, a, no it, SD card. Yeah, That's so it can take an SD card, but it, there isn't one in it. It was, uh, was there? Yeah, yeah, the SD slot's right on the front of the, the main body of the radio. All right. So it may or may not be accessible to the driver. I'm pushing a button called M-pad. And I think that's going, doing something with memories, and I hear a clicking in the radio. So you'll want to go check that out. I, I think I broke the radio. There's a DR mode button. That's for D-Star. It turns the display into Japanese, apparently. Ray was telling me that the DR mode, as of the, I, um, the ID31 radio, uh, has changed quite a bit. DR mode confused a lot of hams in D-Star confused me. I learned it on the ID880 when I did the review for QST, but uh, it's been a long time ago, and he said, <laughs> you can learn your 880, but this is different. What's, what's the big picture? Uh, the big picture is that, that you can uh, put an external GPS on this radio, and you don't have to buy ICOM's GPS, any NEMA any compatible. Any NEMA, NEMA stream, right? Yep. Uh, will uh, uh, give you the GPS functions in D-Star, including the ability to download um, local information. Well, you don't download information from, from GPS. You download uh, repeater data, and the GPS figures out which of the repeaters are closest to you and programs them into memory. Oh, that's so interesting. you've got them all set up, and, mm. and with all the call signs and all the rest of the D-Star stuff that needs to be in the right place. Mm -hmm. So that helps people rapidly. Uh, when we were drawn down here, I spent an hour or so programming D-Star repeater information into my... 2820, and, uh, and that would have made that job much easier. We just get into an area, punch a button, and all the current D-Star, and, and some of that information is old, so all the current D-Star repeaters from the database on, I think, dstarinfo.com would be loaded into the radio. That That's nice. nice. And I did notice after you hit the, uh, the DR button here, part of the display here is showing what looks almost like a sequential list of, of call signs, and we're, yep. I'm like pretty we're sure Japan that Japanese now, but... can be turned to English. Yeah, but, probably but I so. don't know how. All right, what else? Well, there was something interesting we got? about... And no, we got about I, three minutes. I would call it the VFO knob, but it's really the multifunction knob. But the big knob is the best description for it. And it has an adjustment on it. It's uh, just a little slide lever next to it that... Perhaps um, we should be showing this in a picture. Has several... Okay, we'll have to uh, tweak the iris a little. I'll, Let me... I'll tweak the camera. Okay. And the iris. Okay, we're perfect. Okay, there's a couple of detents in this, uh, in this little lever right here, and I'll just slide Almost it up. Perfect. I guess it's got three detents in it, and in the lowest position here, the knob spins with relatively low resistance, and then there's a range where the resistance increases up to a detent at its maximum, and that's, that's pretty stiff right there. Not likely to get bumped while you're driving. And then lastly, this click puts it in a... a a step, a detent step. Can we step hear mode. it? Does it make noise? No, but you can see it pretty good. All right. Let me reset our camera back to closing the program position. Okay. All right. The ICOM 7100, not we don't, available yet. Right. We don't know what it'll cost. And, we, and Ray was saying he was hoping that it would be available by uh, Dayton. But... So, 
they don't and know. if it is, then we'll have cost information for sure. <laughs> but everybody would know by then. Yeah, because it's um, it's at the FCC for certification. Right. Or I'm not sure how that process works. They used anymore. to call it type acceptance. Do yeah. they still call it that? I don't think so. It's certification, and I don't think they actually send a radio. They they kind of do self certification, if I understand things correctly. Okay. But then the FCC has to give them the go ahead to uh, actually sell the radio. When will we see this in your shack <laughs> or in your car, I guess? <laughs> well, I kind of got to know there's, the price. There's a lot more but, radios but, in your car than your shack. Yeah, and, and my ICOM 7000 is pretty new, so um, I'm, I'm not sure. I'll be, I'll be upgrading, and I've got all the rest of the D-Star stuff. And, and interestingly, um, uh, although this, this radio does... HF and you know all modes HF VHF UHF and D-Star all in one radio. I don't want just one radio in my car doing all that because I like to be able to be monitoring FM or D-Star or whatever while I'm operating HF and vice versa. So I pretty much need multiple radios. This is a an, a, this is a, a, the ultimate Ubot. So especially when I'm driving. Yeah. You know what Ubot <laughs> means? Um one band at a time. One band at a time. I, I've invented the terms Ubot and Tubot. One band at a time, two bands at a time. This would very have to useful be a, with uh, with VHF and UHF handy talkies. Yeah. This this would have to do like uh, Qbots, four bands at a time, <laughs> <laughs> to to be able to satisfy what I like to do in my car. So I I do it with a bunch of radios, and I am one happy mobile operator. Yep. And one, one other thing We're about I want to, run to say. Out of tape, so you, you're, you better talk fast. You had asked Ray con concerning the internal architecture, whether it's 7000 like or what, and uh, he said it's an entirely new architecture, um, so it's going to be difficult to compare the performance to you know, yeah. whatever. Yeah, it's whatever designed to be a mobile to. with a with a limited gain antenna, so uh, it's not going to be your contest radio. Okay, we're out of tape. I'm Gary Pierce, KN4AQ. Jeff Wittick, AC4ZO. At the ICOM booth at Orlando, over. And out. You did that well. You jumped right in. Oh, thank you. With the out. <laughs> we're not out of tape yet, so I feel like I should keep babbling. We should waste time. <laughs> <laughs> we, ne we never do that. Until, until the tape actually runs out. <laughs> I don't know if this will be part of the program or not. Oh, it looks like the battery's run. No, that, is that the tape no, that's or the, the battery? That's a little tape icon saying. What's the battery icon much look like? That's up here, and it actually tells you in minutes how much uh, oh. time. Does it move got. to the middle as it's running no. out? No, it doesn't do anything. Oh. It might flash. I, I never run out of battery. I always run out of tape. Long. Oh, wow. Look, look at 396 this. minutes. <laughs> no, today's not a good day to do that. <laughs> <laughs> the festival will be closed long before that happens. Now we'll look over here. <laughs> yeah, well, we, got, we got only the on camera mics. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. This tape is still running, but I'm going to shut her down. This one too, over. but it's a 101. It's blinking. Look, look right into the camera. Stick your big face. Say over. Over. And out. That could be interesting. I don't know. Sure, well. <laughs>